coming before us and, and for saving us, for laying it all down. Lord, I pray that you would help us to always remember what you've done for us, what you've sacrificed for us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to to know you and to follow you and to love you today and every day with all of our hearts and all of our minds and all of our souls. Thank you so much for your sacrifice. It is in your name that we pray today every single day. Amen. What's up, everybody? Pastor Aaron here for your Inside SC. All right, this week, I want to let you know, first of all, we have incredible kids content available for your kiddos that they're going to love. If you're in our online campus, there's a button that says SC Kids. If you're not in any of the other forums that you're watching this, you should be able to find a link to our full YouTube playlist for your kids. Uh, they are going to love it. So give them a phone, give them a tablet, maybe set them up on their TV or your TV and uh, let them watch it while you enjoyed today's service, all right? Second is, I'm gonna share a whole bunch of information with you about a few events that are going on, and you can find all of those on our Simple Church app. All you have to do is go online to your Google Play Store or your App Store and type in Church Center App. When you do that, you let them know you're with Simple Church and all of our information populates, including this great little button that says events. And this is where you'll find information about what we're talking about today. You can even register for these things, uh, get involved in our student ministry and so much more. So first thing I wanna tell you about, you ever wanted to know how to launch your own watch party? Well, it's easier than ever now. There's a button that says watch party. All you have to do is tap that, fill out a short little form of questionnaire about when you wanna do it, how often you wanna do it, what time you wanna do it, and we'll get all of that set up and get you some friends to gather on Sundays so that you can watch uh, the online streaming content together. Second thing is, Easter's coming up very, very soon, and we're super excited about that. In fact, Easter's next weekend. so. I don't know if you've registered yet, but if you plan to join us, we're gonna be at the Marcus Cinemas in Pickerington at 10 a.m. on Easter Sunday, and we'd love to see you there. We're gonna be in the Ultra Screen uh, Theater, and we're gonna be uh, joining the largest watch party we've ever done, and we would love to see you there. So if you're ready to gather in person, this is the service for you. In order to attend, though, we're asking everybody to register. So you can do that right here on the app and choose the Easter tab. Register you, register your kids, as many people as you're going to bring, but invite somebody, bring them with you. If we fill the altar screen, we'll open up a second theater. Don't worry about that. There'll be plenty of seats for everybody. So make sure you register this week as soon as possible so that we can know to save a seat for you. Last thing you wanna know about is we've now opened our studio. If you've been missing a live in-person opportunity to hear the, the gospel messages preached, then you can join us here in our studio. We have limited seating, it's socially distanced and safe, so you can join us. We air, we film actually on Monday nights and would love to open a spot for you. You do need to register because the seats are limited. And again, you can do that right on the app, clicking the join our live studio audience button. All right, well, that's all I've got for you this week, but know this, that the app is useful for so many things. If you wanna take your next step as a new believer, maybe you wanna find out more about our church, and that means you need to take growth track, or you just wanna get involved or ask your question, you can do all that with the app. It's our one-stop shop, so make sure you download it. All right, guys, hey, listen, thanks for your time. Enjoy the rest of today's service. We'll see you soon.
what's up everybody? Thank you so much for joining us, Simple Church Online. I am so glad that you cho chose to log in and worship with us today. I'm Kyle Smith. I am the executive pastor here at Simple Church and it is a privilege and an honor to serve in this position, but also to bring you this message today. Um, before we get started, I hope that if you signed up for your box, you got it already. We're celebrating Holy Week in a different fashion than ever before. I'm so thankful for a team that is willing to step up to the plate and help teach others what exactly this entire week means leading up to Easter Sunday. So today we're walking through Palm Sunday where Jesus is entering into Jerusalem and he's triumphant and people are laying the palms down which is the significance of Palm Sunday. They're laying it down. So as he's riding in Jerusalem, that is what is covering his path. And they're also seen laying their garments down before him. And so I want, you, I want to create an image of this stirring a buzz up to the political officials and the townspeople to see what's going on because they wanna know who this man is and just understanding what's about to happen. But before we get into the message, I also wanna ask you to do something and that's just a personal invitation. Easter Sunday is so important, not just to families, not just to going to church or anything, but it's an opportunity to extend an invitation to someone who has the chance to say yes to Jesus. And it's easy to extend that personal invitation. In my life, outside of church, it looks like what happened years and years ago. I was going through a whole bunch of body image issues and a little bit overweight and, um, my personal invitation to the gym came from a friend who said, hey, I know you've been struggling with some things. I signed up for a gym membership. Would you like to go with me? And that was it. I took the invitation. I said yes. I showed up and it changed my life forever in a way of being able to say yes and go to the gym. And inviting someone to church can be just that easy. And even in this current environment, think about it. You don't have to squirm with seeing what they're going to say or think if you're not sure what the pastor is going to say in the seat next to you. You don't even have to worry about that right now in this current stage that we're in because you can join a watch party in person or have that watch party online and chat in the comments with each other as you're listening to the service. So just think about giving that personal invite to somebody that you've been hoping to invite to church over the past year. All right, so we've been in a four part series. That's what we're currently in called What's Next? based off of the book by Chris Hodges, lead pastor out of Church of the Highlands down in Alabama. Now, what is fabulous about Chris Hodges and his church is that everything that they create, content, resources, media, they provide to other churches to be a blessing. And so many of the processes that we use here at Simple Church, Growth Track, Grow Group Models, most of what we do has been provided by them because they wanna be a blessing to other churches. And I love process like that because I don't want to have to reinvent the wheel. I want to see what already works and just plug and play. And the reason why he wrote this is because he understood that there's questions after we get to know God of like, well, now what? I'm on fire for Jesus. I want to do something. I know I need to change my life, but what do I do next? What is next? And so he wrote this book writing out about the fact that everyone is on a pathway in their spiritual journey somewhere along the spectrum is where any of us will land at any given time. And the great thing about that is that it provides clarity. And clarity is giving clear vision of what we know might need to happen. It lays out a path that we can understand and it makes it a bit easier to start taking those next steps. And I think for some of us, it's understanding those next steps that we can take where we can find joy and peace and feel happy and content about what we're doing. So with our series, we have a theme verse, which comes from Proverbs 29, 18. If people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. And maybe you're thinking, wow, that describes my life. My marriage is a mess. My job is a mess. I don't know what I'm doing. Based on current conditions, I just don't even know what's up or down anymore. And it's just all messy. And we have situations that we've caused in our life, situations that have happened to us that we didn't ask for, that have just created these messes. And I think it's important to look at the fact that sometimes we have these messes in our lives, but we're lacking something or someone bigger in our life than the mess that we're currently in. That's the cool thing about having clarity and understanding some of the vision is that 
the clarity is greater than some of the, the mess or it creates a mere distraction. So once we have clarity, we just see like a little plot twist or what we call the adjust and adapt. So a mess happens, but now we kind of know how to work with it, work around it and keep going. And also when we don't know where we're going and we're stumbling, we find ourselves trying to fix ourselves with other things that can create more messes, but those don't work. We need God for that. And so we need to attend to his plans, not ours, and let his why become ours. So how do we even figure out this, what's next series, this book, anything like that? It's just the question, what's next? And King David said in Psalm 1611, you will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. Joy is not circumstantial. It's walking with God. We find joy when we're walking with God. When we, when we decide we're going to align ourselves and have this relationship with him, we feel that kind of joy. It doesn't matter the circumstance. There's even a phrase, there's joy in the mundane where even the little things that you've got going on in your life that you're walking through, you're so content. You're finding some joy in what you're doing. I think one of the coolest things about understanding and walking through this kind of process is that I understand what my favorite thing about this is. It's that I get to help someone else take their step. Years and years ago, I sang on worship teams and helped lead worship and I enjoyed it. But I don't think I've been as excited about that as I am now when I get to have these conversations with others and help them discover purpose and understand what joy can look like and that it's not based on the circumstances that they're in. And also that doesn't mean that I'm just asking them if they're attending service once in a while or when they're gonna show up or what they're gonna do. It's about understanding that they're taking their steps on their journey, their spiritual journey with their relationship with God and being a follower of Jesus. Not even just calling themselves a Christian, but really learning how to follow who Jesus is and being Christ-like. And so that means that there's steps for us to take. No matter how long we've been a Christian, we've got a step to take. And sometimes we just don't know what to do with that. Sometimes we're just stuck. We feel like we have no joy. We don't know what to do with it. We don't know how to move from it. And it's really easy to stay stuck in a global pandemic. It's easy to say things like, I'm not gonna join church online because I don't like that. It's not the same as being in person. I'm not gonna log into virtual grow groups because I just don't wanna be in front of a screen. Right, I win it. And that is okay for a minute, but it's really easy to get yourself into a rut that way and then not know how to bring yourself back out of it. And then after a while you start to notice, I don't even know what I'm doing. I don't know what I have meaning for. I don't know if I have meaning. meaning. I just don't have any joy. And so what I know is that we need to attend to a way of life. And so we can experience that joy. And so here's the journey laid out in four steps. If you're familiar with Simple Church or even some other churches, you know some of the four steps that we offer. And the first one is know God. And that is simply to describe a relationship that brings power to the next steps. And this is not to just know the book, the Bible, and study that. This is to know him personally. It's also like attending Sunday services so you can get to know more about God every single week. And the second step is find freedom. It gives you the power to come alive and change your life. And so this is where we find ourselves describing the prisons that we've been living in or the bondage, things holding us back. And freedom comes, but it allows us to see our future by settling our past. And that's because you don't need to keep those anymore. You can't change your past, but you can change your relationship with your past. And that's the incredible thing about finding freedom. And so freedom can even look like our girl groups around here. So you're in community and you are learning healing and understanding what you can do to change about your life or behaviors in order to move forward. Step three is discover purpose. You were born on purpose for a purpose. I don't care if anybody says that you are a happy little accident or that you were not planned. That is a lie. You were in fact planned. God has a plan for you and he built you. He knit you in your, weather, your mother's womb. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You're, you are intentional by God for a reason. 
And so at SC, that looks like attending growth track for step three, to discover your purpose. We want to help you identify your gifts and your talents so that way you know why you're here. And so it's a great system to walk through. It's a four-step process. Even, to, even earlier today, we were talking as a staff about the excitement about going back through growth track just to see if there were other things we were missing so we could grow as leaders and keep taking steps forward on our own personal journeys. Step four, make a difference. Because we're on a mission to live life, but we also want to live life that changes lives for others. And so from learning about our gifts and talents through growth track after discovering our purpose, we get opportunities to serve on the dream team. And I wanna let you know that sometimes for people, they come to know Jesus by the smile you give them in the parking lot because you're awesome greeters and you're getting people into the building. Maybe you're hosting them online and you are just chatting them up and saying, hey, how was your week? What have you been up to? Seen any good movies lately? What have you been watching on Netflix? Maybe it's just understanding that you know how to influence your 20 square feet around you. You don't have to think about trying to create these mega movements or projects to be a part of in order to influence and change lives. It can be so simple. It can be handing somebody a cup of coffee and just being a kind, loving person to them, showing them some kindness. And honestly, you have no idea the difference that it can make for them. And so usually we would talk about this in, the different or in a different order of know God, find freedom, discover purpose, make a difference. However, this time we've been doing it in reverse order. So now we're down to week three, meaning st step two, find freedom, going into Easter Sunday. Because I think it's, under, it's important to understand that as a Christian follower, he paid a price so we could be afforded the ability to find freedom. So today we're going to focus on Step two, finding freedom and letting go. And when we look for finding freedom, it's about healing from our habits and our pains. Ironically, when we look through the Bible for a system that helps us work through our healing, everything that God gave us to set that up is about relationships. And I say that that is ironic because it seems like most of our pain comes from relationships. Uh, pain in our marriages, pain with our children, pain with our coworkers, our employees that we're working with, lots of pain, pain with the friends that we have on social media because we're not seeing eye to eye. And we need healing from some of that when we are experiencing that. But just wanna share that Jesus valued and prioritized relationships. It's the greatest commandment of all is to love the Lord God with all of your heart. And why is that? Relationships. If you love God, you love his people, you love yourself, and you love your neighbor. It all points back to relationships there. And also, it's about finding a way to be honest and transparent when we're healing from this pain that we've encountered in our life, regardless of if we made a choice and now we're facing pain, or if something has happened to us and now we're facing the pain. But when we're with others, we can confess our sins, we can be honest and transparent with them, James 5.16 reads, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you might be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So this isn't just sitting down before God and saying, Hey, God, I'm so sorry. I did this. I know I shouldn't have. I said something to my daughter I should not have, and now I need to go say I'm sorry to her. This is going to your daughter and saying that you're sorry for what you said that you shouldn't have. This is going to your group and sharing that, hey, I need to work on how I'm parenting here and I wanna be able to move forward because the outcome that I'm looking for is a greater, deeper relationship with my daughter. This is not a time to gossip with anybody after that person leaves and say, can you believe that they did that? I just, I would never. Nope, that's not at all what that scripture's saying right there. And how do we do this in the Find Freedom? This looks like girl groups at Simple Church. Community, people to walk with. I promise you, put it to the test Life can change because you get out of it what you put into it. For Derek and me, that started years and years ago. We had been attending a church that shut down. The pastor and the overseers, it just wasn't growing. We couldn't get some of the issues around the building fixed. And so the network decided to shut down that church. And so we found ourselves churchless. And if you haven't been through a process like that, that's, that's pretty good because it's like, it's, it's a grief process. You lose what you feel like is a lot of identity for you. 
So we set out on a path to go church shopping. And this wasn't because we just weren't happy. This is because one Sunday we attended and the next Sunday there was nowhere to go. And so a friend of ours knew that our church had closed and he called Derek and said, hey, there's this church in Pickerington. I think you guys would really like it. It's called C3. Go check it out. I think you guys will really be, I think you guys will fit in there. You'll really like it. So we're like, yeah, yeah, we've got a list of things we're gonna check out. We'll put it to the list. And so we went to probably four or five churches each one great, each one had really cool things going on, but we just didn't feel like it was the right fit for us. And so this friend heard that we were still kind of shopping around and looking and he called again, hey, I really think you need to try C3 in Pickerington. I think you guys would really like it. There's people there. I think some of them you know, but other than that, I think that it's just the place for you. So because of not having the success of finding a new church, we decided to go ahead and give C3 a try. And when I tell you that walking into a church and feeling like there was health and kindness and community around me. It was something I had not experienced much before because church had almost become this like legalistic, you have to be here or else. You have to serve in kids ministry or else. Doesn't matter, someone else is always telling you how wrong you are. And walking into C3 was a completely different environment. Walking into C3 and them taking time to get to know us looked like, hey, we heard that you guys are musicians and singers, and we'd love to have you serve on our worship team because we're always looking for people to join us and help move everything further. And that was really cool to be a part of. And then they introduced us to these things called community groups, which is what we call grow groups at Simple Church. And at that point in our lives, not only were we looking for a new church, but Derek traveled some too. So he was gone six days a week, which meant some of the, the family dynamic of our schedule was a little different. And with community groups, I got to go sit down with moms, other moms who their husbands traveled too. So we had common, common ground to talk about. We had similar struggles of going day to day with just our children and putting them to bed maybe without our husbands. I got to join a different, a different group to learn how to manage money differently and just have a different clarity on how to work with it instead of feeling like I just didn't even know what to do or how to even move forward. And now after understanding these processes of the know God, find freedom, discover purpose and make a difference, what I know is that there was also moments that I was finding freedom because I was able to step into healthy environments and healthy relationships instead of the you need to be doing this. It was the, hey, have you considered trying this? Have you signed up for this? Are you able to serve here? We think you'd be good at, you know, serving as the check-in to help get kids through the door. We think you'd be great with some of the toddlers. We think you'd be great on the worship team. And that was some of that finding freedom for me. But ultimately, I think it was really uncovering Derek, discovering purpose for him because Derek has always been creative. I've known Derek since he was 12 years old. And when I tell you that he has more creativity than he knows what to do with it, that's a true and honest statement. And he's the most creative person that I know. And during the, our time at C3, he was discovering that he was built a certain way and discovered his purpose. And discovering that led to a lot of prayer of what we should be doing as a family to move forward. Ultimately, I think that's one of the things that opened us up to stepping into church planning with Aaron and Shanda, Pastor Aaron and Shanda. And so here we are eight years later as a church, discovering our purpose and hopefully making a difference to so many people that were around all the time. But today I really wanna focus on a different element of freedom that Jesus gives us. The freedom that's found in the cross because it's not just the grow groups, it's not just our connections and our relationships, but it's a deeper understanding of the price paid on the cross so we can find freedom. Sometimes I think it's really easy that we'll, we, we ask, hey, do you know that Jesus died on the cross? And we say, yep, he died on the cross, he rose from the cross, and I was a sinner, now I'm forgiven. And we kind of leave it at that. But there is so much more that we can take away from what happened to Jesus on the cross and looking into the days leading up to his crucifixion and even the resurrection, just understanding what some of that looked like. And so I'll be honest, prepping for this message has torn me apart. I'm a crier by nature. If it makes me laugh, I'll most likely cry. Watching TV and it's a bit sad, I'm probably gonna cry. Uh, 
You name it, I'm probably crying. Even in the office, we've kind of talked resident crybaby. Does it make me weak? I just show my emotion that way, I just cry. So I've been owning that emotion and stepping into it this week because we're talking about my Lord and Savior here and the pain that he endured through this week. And I think it's okay too, as we're walking through this, these next few steps of what happened to Jesus, that if you're feeling some of those things tug at you, if you've got questions, that going through a process of self-discovery, of wanting to know him, wanting to have healing from certain things in your life, that is okay. And I say that it's okay because Jesus asked questions that sparked inner re reflection and revelation in ourselves. That's what he did as he was with his disciples and other people. He would ask, who do you say that I am? He was asking for that person to look inside themselves. He would ask the others, well, what do they say about me? Which caused that inner reflection of, well, what do they say? What do I say? It's okay to have that. So if you're having those moments, I want you to know that is okay. First Corinthians 1.18 reads, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And so I know that for some people that looks like wearing a cross necklace as a key identifier for them, or even someone looking at them and saying, well, why are you wearing that? Because you don't really act a certain way, or you talk a certain way, or you live a certain way. Because for some people, it is seen as a, fool, as a foolish act, as a foolish way of living. But to those of us who are being saved, there is power in the cross. There's power in knowing God. And I want you to know that even just understanding the power is the power of the blood that Christ shed for us. And it's not that Jesus got up, he went to it, he did it, and it's done and over with. Every step leading up to the crucifixion, the resurrection of Jesus, was thought out and intentional, intentional, every single step of the way. He didn't just wake up and decide, I'll think about it and maybe go to do that. No, every single step intentional for Jesus. Why? For us. Because it's critical to know the power of the blood. In Revelation 12, 10, 11, 10 through 11, it reads, then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens. It has come at last salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth, the one who accuses them before our God day and night, and they have defeated him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Now we can see what's happening here about what Jesus did because salvation is what he gives us. We see power in his blood, the kingdom of God and the authority of Christ. And the accuser that you read about in there is the devil thrown down because this is the one trying to take us down, trying to take us out every single day of our lives. And then it reads, and then they've they have defeated him by the blood of the lamb, the crucified Lord, and by their testimony, what we go and do with that. And so as we walk through the week of what's happening during Holy Week, we go, we land at Thursday night. And so I'm sure that Jesus has caused an uproar. There's people talking amongst him. There are political people that do not like what he is doing, do not like the celebrity that he is becoming. And we find Jesus Thursday night, having dinner with the 12 disciples, a lot of what we call the Last Supper, much of what you know by the, the very famous art piece by Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci, where they're down the one side of the table. Uh, I don't know many people who sit at a table like that. I'm assuming if I was with Jesus, I'd want to be all around, but I understand. And this is also where we find communion, where the passage where we decide what happens and how Jesus describes it to us, where we get that from. And as they walk through the Passover dinner, Jesus knows what's gonna happen. He knows all of it. And yet he still decides to wash their feet like I said, he knows what's about to happen and he knows he's going to be betrayed. He knows what's to come. I don't know about you, but if I was about to get betrayed by something and asked to a dinner, hang out with some people, I'm about to be like, I can't go out tonight. I'm sick. I'm sick. Especially if I know what's going to happen. And I can surely tell you, I'm probably not going to wash anybody's feet and want to serve them that if I know I'm about to be betrayed, especially knowing what's to come. Probably not going to happen. 
But that's why Jesus is so much cooler than any of us because Jesus still knew and he washed their feet. And at this point, we see Judas sneaking out. And he trades, he's going to trade in Jesus. He's going to sell out information for 30 pieces of silver because later on, Jesus is going to step away to the Garden of Gethsemane. And this is where he's talking to God. He's praying, he's crying out to God. Is this what you want from me? Is this what you want me to do? And I can't imagine the deafening silence because it shows us that God doesn't answer. And I don't mean the like, God, I just want you to bring me my one true love or my mar like my marriage or anything. I mean a deafening silence that solidifies that the plan that God has for Jesus, this is the answer. That no answer is an answer. And so Jesus is still doing what? He's still preparing his heart for what's to come. And that's notable as well, because sometimes we know we're about to go through something, but we don't get our heart ready for it. We know that we're about to step into a season that might be difficult for us. We know that something's happened, and yet we choose to kind of stay stuck. Instead of preparing our hearts and crying out to God and just saying, Lord, I need you. Is this what you want? Is this what I'm supposed to be doing? So I think we can take an element of understanding if Jesus is willing to step aside, walk away, go somewhere quiet and get his heart ready, we can do those things too. All of what's happening to Jesus is really out of protocol in Roman culture. There's six trials that he's going to face. Things are happening late at night where Roman culture, they would have been operating through almost like business hours. They're not going to just yank people out of their beds or anything. They're going to do everything by the book, so to speak. But that's not what happens to Jesus, which is incredibly interesting considering who Jesus is. So there's six trials that happen to Jesus overnight. They're looking for ways to blame him, find him guilty, anything, so they can persecute him and then crucify him. We see it in Matthew 26, 59 through 68. It, it goes down through all of the accounts that they're looking for. But what they're trying to do, the best way to to describe it is cook up the charges. They are searching for everything. If, if he had social media at that time, they would have been straight scrolling to see what they could dig up from any time ago. Anything would not have matter. People even gave false accusations. They would rather perjure themselves than just be honest and say, nope, this guy hasn't done anything. He is who he says he is. But that's not what happened. They kept looking for something. So as they're searching, they're looking through all of, all of what Jesus has done. They can't find anything. And the chief priest is saying, tell us that you are who you say you are. Anything to either have Jesus perjure himself or give in to any accusation that's been brought against him. But Jesus does not. So then Jesus responds, you'll see for yourself. And the chief priest loses it, rips, rips his robes off, calls out blasphemy, and there it is. Death sentence sealed, just like that. They spin his face, they knock him around, and they've got him blindfolded and they're saying, well, come on, prophesy, tell us who hit you that time. And I just want you to imagine the largest bullying situation that you could ever encounter. Knocking him around, mocking him, just to seal that death sentence. Well, tell us you're the Christ, come on, tell us your name. But that's what he says. Son of God, the I am. Because Jesus can only be one of three things. He's either going to be a liar. Well, no, I'm not. And I made all this up as I've been walking through and caring for people and loving them. Or he's going to be considered a lunatic. Or he's going to be considered Lord. But he can't be all three. Because we're not going to follow a liar and just say, well, he's kind of a, I mean, he's kind of cool. And we're probably not going to follow someone that we would consider a lunatic and say, don't listen to him. He does not know a thing of what he's talking about. But we can identify and say, well, he has done this. We saw what he did. We know who he is and we can call him Lord. And then Jesus understands that he's going to face the worst execution. And honestly, over the span of humanity, it is the worst thing that probably humanity has ever done. All the things that could have happened, any of the deaths that Jesus would have gone to. And it's interesting to see that he knew what would happen and yet still landed in a time period where execution, execution through crucifixion would still come to pass. It's the worst, but I think it's the worst because it's a way for Jesus to say, I'm going to walk through the worst so I can show them 
all of us, my love. And it reads in Isaiah 53, 5, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds, we are healed. Isaiah, Old Testament, saw that in exact detail 800 years before it happened. Isaiah tells us the why. America has only been in existence for over 200 years, and there's things that we still can't even call or get it get together in the correct way or remember. But Isaiah reads it exact, exactly as it's going to happen. So there's four wounds that happened to Jesus that he paid for on the cross, and we can have everything here today based on what he was willing to go through then. The first thing that Jesus encountered was the whip. And it's not just what we think of like Indiana Jones and like a, it's called the cat of nine tails. And this is a leather whip that would have had multiple strands hanging off of it, known to have rocks, uh, shards of glass, metal balls attached to it because it would be dunked into water, let the leather expand a little bit, bring that up out, two hands as hard as they can, smash that into someone's back and not just leave it there, but yank it out, ripping flesh away from their bodies. It's interesting and appalling to know that Roman culture knew how many whips it would take before somebody would tap out or die in the process. So Jesus encountered 39, 13 down each of the shoulder muscles and 13 down his back. And I want you to think about doing that, just two hands and smashing that as hard as you can into someone's back and yanking flesh away from him. And he endured that because freedom, freedom in our bodies. And why? Because every stripe that Jesus received represents healing. Because by his stripes, we are healed. Every disease, every sickness, every hurt that we encounter, by that stripe, we are healed. And I know that you might question, why doesn't he heal everyone? I don't know. I have no idea. But I do know that Jesus gives us healing here on earth and the healing that we receive when we go to heaven. So when someone who's encountered a sickness and they pass, they've received a healing and they've gone on. As it reads, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. And the next freedom we see is freedom in our mind. through the crown of thorns that Jesus endured. And for that, Isaiah called it the punishment that brought us peace. You see, Jesus was taken to the praetorium, Herod's place. He was out of protocol, talking about the mockery that he received. Are you the king of the Jews? Total mockery. That king of the Jews is relevant because the kingdom of Judea had been abolished. So this wasn't just a matter of they thought he might be the king. They were mocking him. Well, if you're the Christ, show us. They're mocking him. And with that, he goes through getting slapped. They blindfold him and his response is quiet because we see that he was like a lamb being led to slaughter. And instead of telling them who it was that did it to him, who was spitting on him and slapping him, he remained quiet. And so as one way of mocking him, they took that crown of thorns, grapevine, and two inch thorns, winding it up and placing it on his head, pressing it down. And we're not talking about when you put a little crown on a child's head or you are putting a hat on someone. We are talking about brutal punishment of forcing thorns down into someone's head. And it wasn't just the blood that we see that falls down Jesus' face and he's got pain that is radiating outward, but he's got pain radiating inward. And I think that's where we find some of our non-peace, our stress, our anxiety, our depression, fear, worry, because our brains do that. They, 
they literally can drive us crazy. And Jesus knows that. We see that when we look at that crown of thorns. But it reads in John 14, 27, that it's not just salvation that Jesus, that Jesus gives. It's also peace. Peace I live with you. I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And Isaiah 26, 3 also reads, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. So that's where we can find freedom in our mind. And so that freedom in our mind can come from remembering the crown of thorns that Jesus endured. Before we encounter the third step of what happens at Jesus' crucifixion, I want to paint a picture of what happens as he is leading, as he's leading up to his death. He's got open wounds from being whipped, his head in excruciating pain from a crown of thorns, and then he's forced to carry a wooden cross. No one can help him. His back is bleeding, breaking even. He's exhausted. No one can help him get to this point. And as he walks up and his cross is handed over, planted in the ground, the next step is the nails. And those nails represent the freedom in our hands, the pierced hands, because your hands are everything you have ever done. And your feet are everywhere you have ever gone. And Jesus was then pierced for our transgressions. And a transgression can simply mean a place where you shouldn't have gone, where you went too far. And Jesus experienced that by those nails that were pierced through him. But there's freedom from everything that I have ever done and those nails that were paid for. There's freedom in the things that you have done, the things that you went too far on. And so here we are. We aren't just simply forgiven. We have to know that he doesn't remember what we've done and he doesn't continue to remind us of it. Sometimes we feel that way. We feel like, well, I broke that window that one time or I smashed into somebody's car and I didn't tell anybody and I kept on driving. He doesn't remember it or remind you. Hebrews 8.12 reads, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. That's where it's at. He doesn't remember it and he won't continue to remind you about it. And then in Hebrews 9, 14, it reads, just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. Because our sins have been forgiven, we no longer have to carry the shame because there's freedom. Freedom, healing from our habits, healing from our pain, healing from our choices that we've made, healing from things that have happened to us. And lastly, what we know about the crucifixion is that most of the time, death would be by exhaustion and asphyxiation. And at the ninth hour, he breathed his last breath. He should have been there for days, but that didn't happen. But they also had to make sure that he was dead, that Jesus was dead on the cross. And so they would take a spear and jab it into your, your rib cage, into your cavity, jab around inside of you to make sure, to ensure death. But when they stabbed that spear into Jesus, what came out of him was a mixture of blood and water when they opened his chest cavity. And a lot of times it would have been just blood. But when they opened him up and what came out of him was a mixture of blood and water, what do you think that might signify? It was because Jesus' heart had ruptured. When he died, his heart was broken. There is freedom in my heart. The Bible says a merry heart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries up, dries up the bones. And if you've ever had a broken heart, you understand. If you've been crushed by disappointment, by failure, by things that have happened, the death of someone, broken heartedness. And that's what Jesus died, died from. And why is that? Because he knew he knows he experienced it and he paid for it. He knows that about us. That's how 
I've come to understand how we can have that relationship with him because Jesus just didn't die for us or die for a sin of mine. He even knows the experience of a broken heart to even say, I understand, I know exactly what that is like. Jesus can give us peace in our mind and joy in our heart. Psalm 147 reads, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. So I wanna share all of that with you, just so you know that there is power in the blood that helps us find freedom. And so over the next few moments, as we continue into a moment of prayer, if you have your box, I want you to go ahead and get your communion elements ready because we're gonna have a moment of communion in just a few minutes. But if you don't have that, that's okay too. You can grab a pretzel, piece of bread, a cracker, a biscuit, juice, water, anything to represent taking the communion. The, the broken body, the blood of Christ shed, it's okay. There's nothing that is incredibly special about this. It's about honoring and remembering what Christ did for us. And so I want you to know that. You don't have to worry about a wafer. You don't have to worry about a special bread. It's the, rem the remembrance of it. So if you would just pray with me. God, thank you for giving us Jesus, that Jesus paid the price. I hope that all of us allow that payment to ring in our hearts, that we remember it, and that we would continue to understand that you went through so much excruciating pain so that we could find freedom in our lives. But maybe you're someone who doesn't know. Maybe you're someone who tuned in and you've been wondering like, what, what, what's my purpose? What do I have to offer? Am I even making a difference? And the one I hear the most is, does my life even matter? And I want you to know that I don't think you have the ability to live in total freedom until you say that you're ready to have him in your life. And if you're ready to take that step, then you can repeat this prayer after me. Jesus, come into my life and make me brand new. Show me how to live for you, and I will spend every day doing that. Be Lord of my life. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Now, if you are willing to take that step and say yes to Jesus, I am celebrating with you. I know I told you earlier, I am a crier. If, if I'm happy, I cry. If I'm sad, I cry. If I'm remembering something, I cry. But I am so excited if you chose to take that step. And so, Saying yes means there, there are some steps that you're gonna have to take now, like possibly even baptism and even understanding some part of your next steps in the spiritual journey. And I say all that because I want you to let us know. On the connect card in one of the forums, you can click the links and follow. Let us know, I said yes to Jesus or I'm ready to take my next steps in baptism or I wanna know more about my next steps. We would love to get you hooked up. Plus it's my favorite part because I oversee all of the next steps. So I'm incredibly excited about you knowing God, finding freedom by joining Grow Groups, going through a growth track with our awesome team, and then discover after you discover purpose, then you're making your difference, and hopefully you're joining us in serving. So I am always excited about that. As we move on through, it is time for our offering, and if you are a first time guest with us, there is no obligation to give. But if you have prepared an offering, we wanna thank you so much for everything that you are willing to be a part of because of your generosity we are still able to do ministry we we're able to reach others and so if you prepare that you are able to give that online via the app there's a number that you can text and you can still send it into our po box and we'd be happy to take care of that with you but lord i'm just so thankful for the generosity that continues to happen how we can reach others through the in this together through being able to bless other churches and help others move forward in their steps. Lord, I'm just so grateful for the freedoms that you give us each and every single day. Amen. And one more thing before we get ready for communion is we would love for you to share your story. If God is working in your life, we wanna hear about it. It means so much to us to know that you are encountering and having an experience with God and what God is up to in your life. So take a moment and share it through that connect card and get ready to join us in communion. What's up everyone? So uh, this is a moment where we're gonna take communion. Hopefully 
uh, you had an opportunity to get your communion elements out if you ordered an Easter box. Uh, those were delivered to you this weekend, and uh, there should be some inside there for you for every member of your family that you registered. Um, if you didn't get the elements, don't stress. Um, you actually don't need to have uh, bread or uh, grape juice, kosher grape juice in our situation. Uh, you, you could use just, just a biscuit. You could use um, a, a, a Cheerio if you want to, um, a Fruity Pebble. Uh, anything that is relative to you where you're at uh, and, and any kind of drink, um, th th they're symbols. So I don't put a whole lot of weight on the bread and the juice. This is what Jesus had and they were very symbolic um, in, in what they were. And I'll, I'll explain the, the symbols, uh, what they mean, but take just a moment and go ahead and do that. And I just kind of want to explain where we're at because today actually starts what's known as Holy Week. And uh, Holy Week is the week leading up to Easter Sunday. So all that Jesus went through, um, you know, his trial, his uh, the beating he went through, the crucifixion, his death, burial, and then resurrection, which is what we'll celebrate next week. Um, but this whole week leading up to that celebration of Easter is called Holy Week. So um, today being Palm Sunday is of course where Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And you'll find this in scripture where all of Jerusalem celebrated Jesus' arrival. And in fact, they, they took palms and they were singing Hosanna, Hosanna, our king, because they, they believed their king had arrived and they were shouting this and laying palm leaves down on the road as he rode in on a donkey or a colt that had never been ridden before. And they celebrated his arrival. And I'm not sure exactly what happened in the city that week, except that the religious leaders of the day weren't having it. And the tone changed drastically by the time we get to where the Passover meal was happening. Passover is one of the celebrations that uh, the Lord had, uh, that God had given the Jewish people um, to do since, since they were delivered from Egypt. And it was to celebrate or to commemorate or to remember that God had delivered them from the plague of death where all the firstborn in Egypt had died uh, in, in order to deliver them from Egypt because they were slaves there. This was the price that was paid in order for them to be set free, right? So Passover was a big celebration for them. And so Jesus being Jewish, he's having the Passover meal with his disciples. And uh, these, are, these are the 12 and, and likely some others that were there with him. Of course, there's famous pictures of just him in the 12, but, but they were all sitting down and Jesus took these two elements. He took a cup of wine and he took a cup of bread. And so let's start with the bread. Um, and, and Jesus, you know, I try to get into the headspace of where Jesus is right here. And, um, and Jesus is sitting with his friends and he's having the last meal that he's going to have with them uh, leading up to, uh, leading up to the cross. Like he's, he's getting ready to be betrayed in the garden here in a few moments. And so he's sitting with his friends having this final meal and he takes the bread and he breaks it and he talks about the symbolism here. Now this day in particular in Holy Week is called Maundy Thursday. And so Kyle is breaking the bread possibly in a way that Jesus would have done. Uh, but uh, he, he took some bread and everybody at the table took pieces of that bread. And uh, you don't want to break off a piece as big as I just did because uh, I'm not gonna be able to eat all that. But, but he took this bread and and this bread was symbolic of something. And I really think this is beautiful because Jesus said, this is my body. And he talked about his body that was to be broken for them. And he's speaking about the prophecies of all that he would have to go through. And this bread was important. He wanted them to ingest it. He wanted them to be part of his body. And I want you to, to note, because I think there's a whole lot of stigmatism around being part of the body of Christ, or even just being a Christian in general, being a Christ follower. So many of us eliminate ourselves from this very thing because we think we're unworthy. We disqualify ourselves and say, I don't belong here. But I wanna remind you who was at that table because every single one of the guys at that table would turn their backs and, and uh, abandon Jesus in his time of need, his friend. And there was one guy among them that totally betrayed Jesus. He, he sold him out. That's how they found him in the garden. The, the, the religious leaders found him in the garden that night is because Judas sold him out. And Jesus is sitting with these people and he all offers them all the same opportunity to be part of his body, meaning that no matter what we've done, we belong here. This is an amazing thing. This is an, an overwhelming thing to understand God's love for us, that it doesn't matter what we've done, we belong. And the price he paid and what he endured in our body for us to belong is so amazing. So in commemoration of what Jesus did, 
You know, we no longer have to celebrate the Passover. We no longer have to celebrate all the feasts that, that God recommended or told the, the Jewish people all throughout history to recommend. Jesus gave us one thing to remember, and it's what he did for us as he bore it in his body, the price that he paid, the thing that makes all of us sitting around this space and wherever you're at, part of the same family. So together as we eat, let's not only remember what he did and what he endured in his body, what this accomplished for us. Let's eat together. And then Jesus took the cup. And friends, let me just tell you, just as the Passover celebrates that there was a lamb that had to be slain and the blood of that lamb was put on the doorpost and the blood of that lamb that was on that, those doorposts is ultimately what set the Jewish people free. And it was a type and a shadow of what we talk about of what Jesus would do for all of humanity, not just for the Jew Jewish people. The Jewish people were God's chosen people, but friends, you are part of God's chosen people as he has always intended for us to be part of his family. And so Jesus holds up the cup and he says, this is my blood, though it was just a cup of grape juice like this. He says, this is my blood, which will be shed for you. And they would have understood that a lamb had to be slaughtered. Jesus is, is called the lamb of God. His blood was to be shed so that we could be set free, so that we could find freedom from our past, from our mistakes, from the things that we've entangled ourselves in, for peace for our mind. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace, that's our minds, was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. All of these things caused him to bleed. And when he shed that blood, he did so, so that we could be healed, so that we could be set free, so that we could be forgiven. This blood cost him everything, but it's a free gift to us. So what we're celebrating here is all that Jesus did for us. Not only that he shed his blood, but what this blood paid for. So together as we drink, as a family, let's just remember. And now let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending us Jesus, the greatest gift we could ever receive. But Lord, if I'm just being honest, the greatest gift we could never ask for because we knew the cost would be too much. The greatest gift we don't deserve. But this is not about us. This is about your love for us. God, we thank you for loving us so much that you paid a heavy price and you sent your son Jesus to endure all he endured in his body and to shed his blood for us. Jesus, today we celebrate, we celebrate your sacrifice. We celebrate your obedience. We celebrate your love for us. We celebrate your love for the Father. We celebrate the unity between you, the Father, and the Spirit. We thank you for demonstrating for us how we are to live our lives. And we thank you for all you gave us on Calvary. We thank you that that grace is still available for us today. And, and for many of us right now, we're renewing our relationship with you. We're renewing our relationship with your church. We're renewing that passion. And so God, I pray that as we celebrate and as we commemorate together, you would just renew within us, Lord, a love for you. A, in, in the same way that your love for us has burned, may our love for you and for each other burn. God, thank you so much. We love you, Jesus. Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for staying in a few extra minutes to enjoy a time of communion. Uh, my prayer is that that uh, you, you, you did this along with a Simple Church family. We love you so much. We'll see you right back here as we celebrate our resurrected Lord Easter Sunday. God bless you guys.
because he left it all up to God. Even though Jesus was the son of God, he learned to obey by what he suffered. I know. And at first I was really excited, but once you started reading off what you wanted to do, I realized I can't. I just can't say yes to a plan that I didn't make. A whole raw onion or a whole lemon? I think I'd go with the lemon. Oh, it's so sour. It's a terrible choice. I know the plans I have for you. 